I think we can. Um, I think we can go ahead and start with our first uh, speaker for today is um, Dr. Baroudi, and she will be uh, talking about pediatric pulmonology. We, we can go on to the next speaker. Oh, okay. Um, then we will start with uh, Dr. Jones. Um, and she will be talking to us about um, gynecologic oncology. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Yes, thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you for inviting me uh, today. Very, very excited. Um, and I, I'm excited that we get to talk about some subspecialties. So thank you, Dr. Maynard, for inviting me on today. Um, so I'm Tiffany. I'm a G1 oncologist uh, at Hopkins. And another really cool thing about my job is I'm also a translational scientist. And we will get into what those things are. So I'm a GYN oncologist. So gynecology is essentially the practice of, of women's reproductive organs. And so I went to training for OBGYN and I'm now subspecializing as a GYN oncologist. Now the oncology portion, I'm sure most of you know, oncology doctors take care of cancer patients. So I'm a doctor that takes care of patients with cancer of any GYN or female reproductive organ. Um, I work in the operating room, I work in the clinic, I work on the floor. So for example, in the operating room, I do surgeries to take out cancers from women who have ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, uterus cancer, which is cancer of the womb, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, vulvar cancer. Um, additionally, I see the patients in the clinic. So after they go through surgery or before they go through surgery, when they get diagnosed, I take care of them in the clinic. I do chemotherapy with them um, if they have to get chemotherapy after surgery, before surgery, or instead of surgery. And then also I see them for their checkup appointments. So it's always really nice to see patients who have, are free of cancer and I follow them up to one, two, three, five, ten 10 years. So that's really fun. And then lastly, unfortunately, or fortunately, I take care of patients in the ED. So if patients come in, I take care of them when they get to the actual hospital floor. Additionally, I spend uh, a lot of my time in the laboratory, so I'm also a translational scientist. And some people think of the term from the bed to the bench side or from the bench to the bedside. And it's really, really cool because I get to use my brain and think of ideas of how we can cure cancer because I work directly with the patients themselves. And I also get their tissue and I bring it to the laboratory with their consent. And I do run tests on them to see if we can find targets for cancer. Um, it's really cool because I get to also write, I get to also teach, and my niche in particular is a social justice niche. So one of the big things that I'm really interested in, interested in is figuring out if, for example, where you live or um, how much money you make or the color of your skin or the, the type of school that you went to. I want to understand if those factors influence the tumor or influence how the cancer behaves or how it spreads. So I try to get, I'm, I'm very excited because I get a chance to incorporate my love of medicine and my love of research and science and my love of behavioral science too. So Dr. Maynard asked us um, what we or how, like what we got, how we got interested in our field of our, our field of interest. And for me, it was really no question. Um, I've been wanting to be a doctor since I was a little girl. Um, I've heard about my grandmother, Mary Parker, since I was born. My family would tell me all about her and how strong she was. And she actually was a midwife in the Mississippi Delta. And I'm not sure if many of you all know this area, but it is a very fertile, fertile, very fertile land. And it's where the most gruesome slavery acts, I think, within the country took place, a lot of lynchings. So it has a very rich history. And I'm um, just wanting to, for me, the biggest thing was I wanted to give back to my family and my community community, but in a way that resonated with me. And so I knew I wanted to do OBGYN. I knew I wanted to take care of women. But I also, once I learned more about cancer, I, I knew without question I wanted to be a cancer surgeon as well. Um, and so this is my grandma. She was a sheer cropper in Mississippi, and she unfortunately died of um, ovarian cancer at the age of 39. So she's loved by all, and she's the reason I'm here. 
So I wanted to briefly talk about like what I had to do to get to to become in this field. Um, the first thing was undergraduate school, so college. Then I did um, four years of medical school. And then after medical school, you decide what specialty you want to do. So the other panelists tonight will talk about what they the decision they made after medical school. But I wanted to be an OBGYN from the beginning. So I went into OBGYN residency here at Hopkins. And then after that, people have the option after they finish OBGYN residency to be your general OBGYN. And I thought I was going to do that for some time, but in residency, I decided I wanted to do G1 oncology. So that again is a doctor who women who have uh, cancer of the reproductive system. There are also other subspecialties. I just want to do a shameless plug for the other subspecialties. There are other subspecialties that we have as well, including IVF or reproductive endocrinology and infertility. I'm sure you all have heard on the news about Alabama um, banning IVF. And so this has a really big implication for women's health. You can also go into urogynecology or female pelvic, female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. We consider them the plastic surgeons of GYN. They also help like older women whose organs are falling out literally, or women who have to have who, you know, urinate on themselves, et cetera. They help fix their pelvis to make it as functional as possible. There's also family planning. These are the ladies who are the, I'm sorry, not ladies. These are the women or the men, doctors, physicians who take care of women who are undergoing abortion or trying to plan for family. Adolescent gynecology is a specialty where you're not an adult, you're still an adolescent or a teenager, but you have you might have a gynecologic uh, dis disorder or a situation or um, disease by which you need an adolescent gynecologist. And then a lot of people are familiar with maternal fetal medicine. These are the doctors that are high risk obstetricians. They take care of women who have preeclampsia, preterm birth, spina bifida, um, really all the complications of baby or mother. And then lastly is minimally invasive surgery. These are the, the surgeons who take care of women who have like fibroids, endometriosis, PCOS. So there's a lot of ways to go about um, women's health and women's health care in general. You can see all the options. I do want to highlight that in addition to the 12 years of training, the training that I undergo to be a G1 oncologist will actually require an additional one to three years. So it is a, it is a upfront cost um, in terms of the time that you do make. So going back to myself, I'm just going to leave this here. This is me when I was five years old. Um, these are the things that I was told all the time when I was little. I am a very shy person. I am an introvert. I never thought I would be able to really be a impactful doctor or an impactful scientist growing up because of these traits. Um, but, you know, growing up and really honing into my talents and my skill set, my parents helped me um, gain the confidence to be able to push myself and go there. So just a little bit about me, I did track and field in, in high school and college, and that's really when I think I was able to, you know, just have a better appreciation of community and believe in myself. I also joined organizations and I went to the University of Wisconsin. Then I went to Uganda for three months of my senior year in undergrad, and that really changed my life. That was like the period exclamation point that I want to go into medicine. I want to help people and I definitely want to be a advocate for women's health. I went to University of Illinois for medical school. And then here's me, my first day of residency um, at Hopkins. Dr. Maynard wanted us to briefly go through things that we wish we, know, we knew then that we know now. Um, the first thing, there's three things just really quickly. The first thing is um, I, I realized it was okay to be vulnerable. It was okay to fail. Um, I am a perfectionist. I am very judgmental of myself. Um, I'm someone who is a people pleaser. And so I really had to get to know myself on a deeper level and be very introspective in order to gain confidence to then go out and take care of people. So I, in order for me to be able to be a good doctor, I really had to get to know myself. Um, so these are, these are just some books that I read as I was in residency that, that kind of helped me get to that place where I could feel confident in my skin. Number two is listening to your intuition. Your heart knows your personal legend. So there's always in the back of my mind, there's always been this, this like voice that's basically like the direction I wanna go in, but I have to listen to it. And it took me a little bit of time to listen to it, but really what I found is that when I look at history or when I look at people who have had similar situations as myself, I'm able to look at their experience and I'm able to like 
transplant that experience to mine, because if they're successful, then I can be successful too. And I can listen to my intuition because I know it's there, if that makes sense. Um, so these are just some of the books that I have read over like the past like five years that I think have really helped me understand myself and also help me understand other people. And being a doctor, this is really, really important. And so I use this day to day, day in, day out. I use the tools that I've learned from history of learning about myself and others. And then last but not least, I started crafting my vision like this year. I recommend you start crafting your vision now. Um, just be bold and create the world you want to see, quite literally. So a vision is a mental picture of what life could look like. It's a glimpse of the end result before you even start. Here's my vision statement. My vision is to harness the power of scientific discovery by liberating patients, cancer patients from inequitable outcomes. I don't want patients to die just because they, they lived in this particular neighborhood. I don't want patients to die just because they weren't able, they weren't treated a particular way because of the color of their skin. So that's sort of where, you know, that's my perspective on how I want to, how I want to change the world. In terms of being a physician scientist, the pros are the patients by far. I know patients that are very young, like in their teens who have cancer all the way up to their 90s. So just a complete spectrum of people. I get to work with my hands. I'm always learning and I get to fuse my, my love of giving back to the create creativity that I really harness in the laboratory as well. In terms of cons, as I'm sure you guys could probably appreciate short term sacrifice long term paradise, I have about three more years of training and I'm done. And I feel like after that I can really do whatever I want to do based upon the training that I've received up to this point. The early bird gets the worm. I do. I love to sleep. I can sleep all day. But I had to get up to go to work and go to surgery because OR time is usually 730. So those are some things I have to just I have to sacrifice. Um, hard days, you know, like diagnosing a patient with cancer sucks. Um, watching a patient go through the hospice process and finally the dying process that sucks too. Um, but it's a it's a process and, a, and it's a and it's an experience that I wouldn't give up for the world. So it's a con, but it can also be a positive because I learned so much from the patients and they just give me so much wisdom. And then no two days are the same. And I think that could be a con or a plus. Like one day I'm in the OR, one day I'm in the lab, one day I'm in the clinic. So I like the variability and I really, I love what I do. And so last, I wanna just leave you with this. Um, this is my favorite book in the whole world, The Alchemist. Um, Tell your heart that the fear of suffering is worse than the suffering itself. And that no heart has ever suffered when it goes in search of its dreams, because every second of the search is a second's encounter with God and eternity. That's it. Thank you so much. And I'll be happy to take questions after. Wow. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jones. This was, uh, I think, very helpful um, to everyone that that listened. Um, so next we have Dr. Um, Brandt. He will talk to us about his experience going into an orthopedic surgery career. Um, thank you, Dr. Brandt. All right, yeah, let me get this pulled up. Um, should be on a orthopedic surgery slide. Yes. Okay, great. Well, um, good evening and or afternoon. Um, and thanks for having me on. Uh, I yeah, like, like Dr. Jones, I'm excited to be on here. I think this is kind of the valuable stuff and kind of just being able to share our stories and make sure you understand that the end point is possible, <laughs> I think is the, uh, is a big factor in just going into these fields and 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 trust in the process. So, um, I pulled these slides together from a few different talks that I give. Um, so it's it, they're not necessarily specific to these questions, but I did pull together a little uh, keys uh, or a pros pros list at the end. So we'll try to go through quickly, and then um, the majority of it I figured would be based on our discussion and Q and A. So. Um, orthopedic surgeon. Um, I work at Hopkins. I'm an assistant professor. I'm in my third year um, on staff here, and my uh, particular specialty is pediatrics. And so what is orthopedics? Um, 
this is where I think people get get things confused a little bit. Orthopedics is specifically kind of the surgical uh, perspective on uh, musculoskeletal health. So there's a lot of different avenues you can take. Um, orthopedic surgery is not the end all be all, but when when it comes to surgical options, that's when we um, uh, get involved. So um, anything from injuries, deformities, uh, things like that. Um, but if it's involving the bones, it's probably probably us. We are the carpenters of, uh, or we are the carpentry of on humans. We use plates, screws, um, rods, nails, all these different things. This is literally a drill that I've used uh, in the emergency room on people. That's not the one we use in the OR, don't worry. Um, this is a setup, this is on a hand, so much smaller unit, but we can have setups that are much bigger in the operating room as well. Um, we treat, these are kind of the list of subspecialties, but we treat trauma, joints, hand, foot and ankle, spine. Uh, pediatrics covers all of it. Um, oncology, like Dr. Jones, um, there's a lot of musculoskeletal cancers that come through. And, and we, so we have to deal with those as well in conjunction with the oncologists. Um, and then on the right side is, again, just going back to the smaller subsections of everything else. So the uh, the list is vast and we, we there's a lot to it. Um, but orthopedics as a whole um, has a lot. Um, I think the most common thing that people see other than trauma, obviously, um, are joint replacements. I think this is what kind of has really changed things. Hip replacement is probably the most successful surgery ever um, and the most effective uh, thing. It removes a bad joint. It gives you that, that same day surgery now and it it lasts a very long time. So it's just one of those surgeries that is very successful, very effective. Um, I'm sure you see a lot of people uh, with them and you don't even realize it. Um, what do I do? I do pediatrics. So this can be um, anything involving a child. So anything uh, essentially 18 and under. Um, and I specialize in trauma, deformity, and hip uh, uh, specifically. And so some of the procedures I do for hip preservation can go into a young adulthood as well, um, just depending on the complexity uh, of what, what needs to be done. So um, these are just some images and I had a few more and they just didn't come through. Sorry. But anytime the, the fact that kids are going to continue to be kids means that I will never lose my job. Um, they will continue to fall from these structures that for some reason will never leave a playground, um, despite the public health crisis that is a monkey bar. Uh, but they will break anything and we are there to fix it. So we uh, may just use casts, which I use a lot for kids. It's kind of like we, we get to be able to mold and be very artistic, essentially, with these uh, casts and kind of reshaping things. Um, we use pins. I use a lot of pins for kids because then I can pull them out in clinic and I don't have to take them back to the operating room. Plates and screws you can see there. And then um, I also use a lot of in rods that go inside of the bones. So things that go inside of these bones uh, to kind of pull things together. Oh, there they are. All right. Um, and then I don't know how this one's going to come because I literally just pulled this from a, another talk, but um, I clearly was standing on that side of the, the screen when I gave, the, gave this talk. But this, my story is I, I grew up in a small town in Nebraska, um, 4,500 people. Um, and yes, that's small. We had one stoplight. It was uh, not the funnest. I was the only black person in the, or for, for a long time in, in the community, other than my family members here. So um, that kind of shaped uh, kind of my perspective on a lot of things. It kind of gave me a good view of that. Uh, you may not fit in certain places um, and medicine's one of those places that we're kind of well are, are the minority and um, so that's kind of a hurdle some people have to go through uh, to kind of commit and especially orthopedic surgery we're still uh, two percent of orthopedic surgeons are, are african-american so um, it's just not it's not there that was never a factor for me because that's how i grew up so this is my family uh, very large uh, adopted nine of us were adopted so just a lot of diversity, a lot going on, um, a lot of personalities in that household, which which helped a lot. Um, everyone in my family were teachers, coaches. There were no uh, people in medicine. Um, like Dr. Jones, I was an athlete. Um, I played basketball at Creighton, and and that career ended with uh, some injuries. Ran track at Nebraska. That career ended with some injuries. Um, and then I studied nutrition science, which is not the standard uh, uh, major. And I thought that that was... Uh, that was something I just didn't, I didn't want to do biology. I didn't want to do those things. I didn't want to focus like that. 
Um, and as I went through medical school and went through the process that continued to be brought up as an interesting thing. So that's something to keep in mind is that there is a, a power in diversity and, and kind of diversity of thought. Um, and then I went to NYU School of Medicine. Uh, that was just kind of another random thing. I, I saw New York as just this fish out of water opportunity and to test myself again. And it, and it was awesome. So um, that was a great experience for me, just kind of completely flipping, flipping the script on, on life, as you will. Um, and then uh, learning a little bit about myself. And then through the process, I actually almost went into pediatrics alone, uh, by itself and got lucky with a mentor um, that essentially just called me an idiot and told me that I needed to go into orthopedics, um, which was very impactful and, and led to uh, residency where I um, in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, where I did my training. So. Um, and then the why medicine is something that uh, in the past, people always tried to get me not to tell the story, but um, I don't care. Uh, so Lost, if you guys are probably too young to remember this show, but it was uh, my junior year when in high school when this show came out. And I watched it because I thought it was going to be this like Jurassic Park type TV show. Um, and it was not. And the first episode, uh, this uh doctor um in this disaster situation just like snapped into action went and was helping everybody and just really uh, uh took care of everybody in a really in a crisis and I, I at that point I had no clue what I wanted to do and I looked at that and I was just like I think that I think that's it um and that was it so uh, my parents were confused and they're like okay whatever um and it was just one of those things where it kind of I got in my head and I, and I kept moving with it so um, it was an awesome serendipitous, uh, thing. And I, I, I was around orthopedics. I was obviously an athlete. I did not like my doctors. I did not like the field, uh, from my, from my vantage point, but, um, in, in the end, it really was good. It's hands-on. It, it really does. Uh, it's fun. And then this is, a. Uh, Kind of going back to kind of the why, this is my uh, AAU basketball coach and he was at my med school graduation and these are my parents. So these are people that had nothing to do with medicine, but were so influential in just keeping me, me, um, that they were, they had a place at my, uh, at the finish line, if you will. Um, so the pathway, um, uh, Dr. Jones touched on majority of it. When you go into specialties, it always adds uh, time to training. So this is always a commitment. And I think that that's one thing you just kind of have to uh, wrap your head around. That's partly why I almost went into pediatrics was because orthopedics was an additional three years at least. Um, and it's also uh, a bit of a grind. Uh, Dr. Jones brought up the early mornings for ortho. It's often three or four in the morning um, can be and can be very late as well. So um that there really is no clock on, on that. So like the hundred hour work week, we're, we're towing that line uh, often and that's illegal. Um, but, uh, cause they now have restrictions for that, but, um, it's, it's, it's hard to not be a doctor, uh, when that time, when that clock runs out. So, um, the time I think is the biggest hurdle that a lot of people have to kind of get, get through and the training is kind of grueling, but it's, it's, it's fun. It's rewarding. So if it's something that you're interested in, if you like that, then you need to explore it. Um, the keys for me, and I don't like to talk about kind of, kind of the negatives. I think those are going to come no matter what you do. Um, I think it's how you kind of a, approach those things and deal with them that that has kind of changed the changed the game for me. So I expected a lot of bumps. I did not expect to fit in. I did not kind of have those expectations throughout the process, but it, they always caught me off guard when they came. And and I think that's one thing that I had to go back uh, to kind of the basics for myself and remember that I have been through a lot growing up and been through a lot to get to that point. And, and that was kind of uh, what got me through the process is every time I kind of went off the rails or felt like I was running into a bit of a wall, I had to kind of remember who I was. So the authenticity piece has been something that has been uh, discussed about me um, as being positive and something that I have to remind myself uh, often and has, has really gotten me through. Be, be yourself. Um, that's the only way you can, can function and, and function at a high level. Um, you need to remember your purpose and your why. I think that's one thing that is important, especially when you're not sure uh, that it's necessarily the path you want to go. I obviously didn't have a clear reason why I was doing what I was doing other than I knew 
that I wanted to help people and and wanted to make my life more, more bigger than or or mean more than just uh, me. And so that was my that was my reason. Um, and then I live day to day. I really do. I, I I do have kind of long term goals, but I really do kind of just approach things and and tackle hurdles as I go. So um, if you can kind of get out of your head a little bit and remember the remember the uh, to like the process or or deal with the process and not not get too far ahead, it, it really helps. So those are my uh, kind of keys. What's kind of helped me through, um, and I'll answer any questions when we get to that stage. Thanks. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Brandt. That was, again, uh, very inspiring. Both talks I think we've um, listened to so far have been very inspiring. Um, our final panelist for today is Dr. Parouti, and she will um, talk to us about a career in pediatric pulmonology. I really should have went first. I don't know if I can follow both of Dr. Jones and Dr. Brandt's presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm Sahara Barboudi. I'm one of the pediatric pulmonologists at Chubb Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And let me see if I can share my screen. Uh -huh. Can you guys see it okay? Um, I am not able to see it. Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's a very brief um presentation compared to the previous other amazing presentations. Perfect. Um, so like I said, I'm Sahara Baroudi. I am a pediatric pulmonologist, and I also I'm from Nebraska, kind of. So it's just amazing that there's another person that even set foot in Nebraska. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, I went to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln for undergrad. And if he's from Nebraska, that makes total sense that he's an ortho, fun fact. And you can correct me if I'm mistaken, but the Nebraska Stadium, um, the football stadium of University of Nebraska becomes the third largest city in Nebraska in terms of population and football days. Is that still a fact? Um, so it makes perfect sense that he's an ortho, has nothing to do with my pulmonary choice. Um, I stayed there for med school, and then I came to New York for residency. I was at Johns Hopkins for fellowship. And now with my fifth year of being a pulmonary um, attending at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and so the way that I think that is pulmonary is actually a little bit of a longer um, route, I think, compared to other people. I um, remember in med school when we were told about different careers was to first decide which patient population you wanted to work with. Um, and I it's probably about the third drunk driver during my trauma surgery that I was like, nope, so I'm going to all be dealing with pediatrics from now on. Um, but kind of putting the jokes aside, I have always been interested in physics. I actually started off my undergrad um, as a engineer major. I love physics. I love the mechanics. I love um, how things work, it just made perfect sense to me. But then as I kind of like grew and matured and thought of what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to work with humans and not machines for the rest of my life. Um, and so I took physiology, absolutely fell in love with it, made perfect sense how the body works. Um, and fast forward in um, when I was choosing a career in pediatrics specifically, um, it kind of found pulmonary that would fit the love of both my mechanics and physics and how things work. Um, and also physiology, um, and it just made perfect sense of trying to solve a puzzle um, and applying the medical knowledge that you have to figure out that medical puzzle and figure out and tailor the perfect therapeutic options for the patient. Um, in also choosing a career in medicine, I, I wanted to do something, a little bit of both, I'm a Gemini, and so I felt like if I did one thing or another, I'm just going to get bored of it. Um, I was actually, lastly, between the um, ICU and pulmonary as an option. Um, but I ended up choosing pulmonary, um, I think not just the lifestyle choice, um, but I also wanted to see the patients and carry them through the darkest time, 
while they're in the inpatient, in hospital, um, probably during the scariest time, and then um, having the pleasure of following them up as our patient and seeing them coming to full recovery and even discharging them from clinic. And it just went absolutely, some of the most absolutely amazing um, feeling is to actually cure a patient and be able to say, you never have to see me again, as amazing as you are. Um, and so pediatric pulmonary specifically is basically anything that deals with breathing of the child. So anything from the nose all the way down to the smallest um, alveoli. And we work in a couple of settings. We work in outpatient and inpatient setting. And so uh, most of our practice is outpatient clinic where we see a number of patients. Um, but we also do procedures um, like example for tomorrow, I have a bronchoscopy day. Um, in the OR where I'm going to be doing a number of cases. Um, just to give you guys an example, I'm doing three cases tomorrow. Um, one of is a little NICU baby that we're trying to figure out where the stride is coming from and why they're failing extubation from a long-term mechanical ventilation. The second case is a, um, a kid that's going to get um, a cardiac surgery that's had multiple cardiac procedures to fix the congenital heart defect um, and has bronchial compression. Um, and so we're evaluating for the level of compression while working with our um, interventional cardiology colleagues. And then um, the third bronchoscopy is a recurrent pneumonia, recurrent infection kind of picture, more of a, um, a lavage, looking for the source of infection, look to see if there's any signs of aspiration or reflux. So you really get a breadth um, of multitude of etiologists and pathologists in pulmonary. Um, we also do a number and array of inpatient services. Um, I am working in one of the biggest um, children's hospital in the States. Um, I think between us, Texas and Boston Children's, we're probably the three biggest, and Cincinnati, the four biggest children's hospitals. So it's very, very busy, um, probably busier than other institutions. And because of that, you get to see a super subspecialized um, group of patients. Um, but it really ranges of primary patient, i.e. admitted patients to our own surgery. Those are mostly um, in the past, it used to be cystic fibrosis, not as much now because we've done such a good job in terms of genetic therapy that they really even get hospitalized. Um, we do see a couple of asthma patients. Um, at CHOP specifically, we have a lot of technology dependent children patients. Um, so trach on a ventilation or CPAP, BiPAP, any kind of non-invasive ventilation um, or any combination of rare interstitial lung disease, um, transplant lung transplant patients. You know, which we see it and we have them in our inpatient service. We also do consults in the NICU, so um, babies, either full term babies or premature babies um, of different pathologists. We do consults in the PETS ICU and the cardiac ICU and all the other um, general pediatric floors and specialty floors. Um, this is really my last slide, but this is kind of to give you a picture of this, none of those people are my patients, uh, but to kind of give you a little breath and um, pediatric pulmonary is, is a very um, wide spectrum um, specialty that um, even within that field, you can kind of specialize and kind of go towards whatever we gravitate towards. Um, on the left, oops, go back. Um, and so on the left of the picture is a little kiddo in the blue outfit who is getting hooked up, for example, for a sleep study. Um, and that gives us a, um, a a scientific number of data in terms of how severe of persistent apnea child is and whether she needs to get um, tonsils address removed or whether she needs to be on a CPAP um, machine to help her breathe at nighttime. Um, the patient that has all the tubing connected to her is a, a trained ventilated patient. And we really do see a number of those patients for a number of pathologists, either because of prematurity, um, a neuromuscular disease, um, a genetic condition, a lung parenchymal disease, or just completely like pulmonary, part of pulmonary failure. Um, and then the picture below is an example of what we do in the OR in terms of bronchoscopy. Um, and it's probably one of my favorite fields in pulmonary specifically, just because it's evolving. And um, we get to really um, change the um, phase of pediatric pulmonary and how much we can do. As, as it's going. A lot of times you come in and most of the medicine has been explored, not in this particular field. Um, there's really a lot that we can do with that. Um, one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite patients, for example, is we had a kid that had aspirated on a pen. Um, they tried to remove the pen um, a couple of times at an outside hospital. They failed and actually the only next step for them, they, they offered the families to do a lobectomy, which is removing a completely healthy um, lobe of the lung, and she came to our hospital. We were able to successfully remove it. It was a long procedure. 
it took a couple of us a couple of expertise to take it it took about maybe like two hours but we finally removed it and saved the kid a lobectomy and actually just discharge her home with not even any follow-up required um so there's a lot of similar stories and i'll be happy to share more with whoever is interested in pediatrics or even if they're going to internal medicine if they're trying to decide which subspecialty to go into. Um, I don't have a slide for the pros and cons, but the pros I think I share with um, a lot of what Dr. Um, Tiffin and Aaron have said, which is the patients is probably the number one thing. It's just absolutely a blessing um, to be able to take care of those little kiddos and make a difference in their lives earlier on and have them set them for success for the rest of their lives. Um, it's absolutely a joy just seeing the kids and um, in particular working with them. They just want to get better. They want to feel better. And they really, the patient really do help you in this case to um, get better. Um, I would say the only con in particular of the time, I mean, in terms of time of training, it's three years in residence, three years in fellowship. But I think the bigger con is probably the salary. I mean, my salary is a fraction of the other physicians that we have in here, but it's a small price to pay if that's what you truly love. And that's it for my presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Parudi. I think um, your talk gave us a lot to think about. I think um, all three talks, um, they made me think about a lot. I think it's very important to think about pros and cons. This is a very big decision, dec deciding your specialty. Um, and like, I really appreciate all the advice you gave us. Um, so now I think we can move forward to the Q&A part